Good morning. You guys awake? Yeah. The few and the proud on this cold morning. Happy Sunday morning online and in person. I'm Pastor Dave. We're going to have a great worship day today. Um, this I have discovered that we, um, we have a tardiness problem some days. And so um, we'll, we'll, we'll welcome our brethren as they, as they start to flock in in a little while. And God bless everybody. God bless everybody who's on their way here. And um, will you join me in prayer as we get started? Our God and our Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the beauty of today. Not the weather, but the beauty of a new day that you gave us. Thank you for your goodness and your power and the way that you work in people's lives to transform them with your grace and your goodness. I pray, Lord, that as we celebrate you today, that you would be honored and blessed in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. So uh, we're going to have a great day. I, I just want to get you guys ready. There's a countdown before Easter going on. Easter is just weeks away, and we're excited that Easter's coming, and uh, we get to celebrate the Lord Jesus and his resurrection. And um, are you guys ready to celebrate Jesus for his resurrection on Easter? Yeah. Uh, are you sure? That didn't sound very sure. You want to try again? Are you guys ready to celebrate Jesus for his resurrection? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Amen. Amen. So worship team's ready to go. Just kind of want to set you up for today. So we, we're um, in, the, in our study of the Gospel of Mark. We've been doing a sermon mini-series, four weeks on Jesus' parables about the kingdom. And today we conclude that, and I'm going to preach a message called The Smallest Conspiracy. So if you like conspiracy theories, this is going to be your Sunday. This is going to be your Sunday. So God bless you guys. Why don't you rise with me as we get ready to worship the Lord. Take away for my good, for who am I to 
church. I want to share another little story with you, and you may have heard this, but uh, there was this little boy, and he loved to go to church every Sunday. 
But this particular Sunday, he was sick. So he had to stay home, and his mother stayed home with him. But his dad went to church. And uh, when church service was over, the dad came home, and the little boy noticed he had something in his hand. And he ran up to him and says, Dad, Dad, what's that in your hand? And he says, it's a palm branch. Palm branch? Yeah, it's a palm branch. You see, when Jesus came into town, everybody around were waving their hands and waving the palm branch and shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. They did that to honor him. So we all got palm branches today. The little boy had a sad face on his face and said, oh man, the one Sunday that I missed is the Sunday that Jesus shows up. You know, Easter, as Pastor Dave said, is right around the corner. In three weeks, we will be acknowledging Palm Sunday. But not only is the word Hosanna a praise and honoring him, but the real meaning is save now. It was a plea when the people were shouting Hosanna to have them, have Jesus help them. And if you look around today in our society and our country and even the world, we have a great need. You know, there are many groups promoting, trying to abolish, change, many things that our great nation has stand for. They want to erase and change history. They want to eliminate God. But we know that there's only one person, no politician or special interest group or person can change that, but only Jesus Christ. Amen? So, it's only fitting that we shout to God and say, Hosanna, because that one word is a unique word. It simultaneously pleads our need but also praises him because he will prevail, right? So let's all stand again as we sing Hosanna.
Good morning. Go ahead and take your seats. God bless you guys. I'm glad to be together in the name of the Lord. It's good to worship Him together. My name is Dave Lanto. I'm the pastor here at Victory. Excited to be together by His grace. You know, whatever's going on in your life, my prayer, my hope is that as we come together as God's people, that we can begin to see the Lord at work in circumstances or outside of our circumstances in a broader way and drawing us into his goodness, ministering to us with his grace. As we get started today, I want to tell you about a legend. There's a legend around the painting, the famous painting of the Last Supper, which was painted by Leonardo da Vinci. And it's kind of like a conspiracy theory about this painting, if you can imagine that. And the story says that Leonardo da Vinci, when he painted the face of Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed Jesus, when he painted his face, he used the face of someone he knew. In fact, it was a rival painter who was an enemy of da Vinci. And the story goes that he painted the face of, uh, with, of Judas with the likeness of this man. And that da Vinci took great pride in the fact that he was immortalizing his enemy's face as Judas Iscariot. And that people for the ages to come when they saw Judas, they would think of the face of this man who was his enemy. And, and, he, and he got this sadistic satisfaction from knowing that people in his time would actually look at this painting and see that man and be able to go, hey, that's so-and-so. And so the story goes that he took this delight in the painting of his, his enemy for the picture of Judas Iscariot. So what do you think? You know that, that, that this priceless painting that is, is at the heart of Western civilization and even the heart of Christianity, that this painting is marked by da Vinci's hatred for his enemy. Do you think it's true? Or is it a conspiracy theory? Or, or did people create this story to taint this beloved picture? That's kind of how conspiracy theories go. And today's message is called the smallest conspiracy. The smallest conspiracy. Conspiracies have this way of bubbling under the surface of society. And there are conspiracy theories in the United States about who's running the government. There are conspiracy theories of, about uh, the, the, the assassination of JFK. We've got conspiracies about the Hollywood elite. We've got conspiracies about Jewish people, about the COVID-19 pandemic and its origins. There's so many conspiracy theories floating around. That's just a handful that, that I've heard. I just did a simple search, and those are some of the popular ones in our day. Well, only time can tell about whether a conspiracy theory is truth or a lie or something that's made up. And today I want to address a conspiracy that was raised in the Scripture. And Jesus raised it Himself with a story that He told, a parable that He told. In the Bible, the, 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 the stories that Jesus told that try to picture the kingdom of God, these stories are called parables. And a parable means a heavenly truth alongside an earthly story. And so the concept of the universal reign 
of God, also known as the kingdom of God, was not clear to Jesus' disciples. They didn't understand when Jesus talked about the kingdom, they didn't understand what he meant, what he was saying. Because the, the popular thinking was that the kingdom of God would be a physical reality that a new kingdom would rise and it would be with God at the throne and it would overthrow earthly kingdoms. And it would operate by rules of God's kingdom from heaven on high. And, but we can see how much... So the disciples expected within their lifetime for the kingdom of God, this earthly kingdom, to begin and overthrow in their day the Roman Empire, which at that time was the greatest empire the world had ever seen. And they seemed to keep looking for the establishment of this earthly kingdom. Whenever they thought about the kingdom, whenever Jesus talked about the kingdom, and he kept telling stories to help them picture what it's really like. And we can see that they misunderstood it in this selfish request that was made by James and John in Mark 10.35. James and John, two of Jesus' closest disciples, made a request of him, and they said, Lord, in the kingdom, can we sit on your right and your left side of your throne? We want to be the guys that are right next to you. A very selfish request that they made. We want to bypass anyone else, any of the other disciples, and we want it to be us at your right and your left side. We see it in the eager question of his disciples after his resurrection when he appeared to them in the book of Acts, in Acts 1-6 when they asked whether now was the time that he would introduce the kingdom. Well, today we're going to explore this parable of the kingdom that Jesus gave. It's our fourth week exploring these these kingdom parables. And he again, he gave this, this parable, this story, little story, to help them understand what the kingdom is really like. So today, as we explore this parable, it's from Mark chapter 4, verses 30 through 33 or 34, we're going to read. And we'll go ahead and begin. The smallest conspiracy. If you want to follow along with me, I'm going to start reading at verse 30. And he said, With what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown on the ground is the smallest of all seeds on earth. And yet, when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make their nests In its shade. Verse 33. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them. And as they were able to hear it, he did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples, he explained everything. I just want to point out two truths about this parable to explore this simple parable today. And I'm just going to ask again if you'll join me in prayer as I begin. Lord, we thank you for your word and how rich your word is with truth for us to apply to our lives today to help us understand the world, how you work in it, and how we can join you in what you're doing. I pray, God, that you would be with us as we explore your word over these next few minutes. I pray that you would bless this time Enlighten our eyes and our ears and our minds that we can receive what you have for us today. Amen. Amen. So the first thing that I want to point out is that from very small beginnings, 
the kingdom would eventually grow in its size and its influence from a very small size. Uh, Going back to verse 30 and 31, Jesus said, I'm going to read verse 30 and 31 again, and he said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown in the ground is the smallest of all seeds on earth. While the mustard seed is not the smallest seed in the world, it it was probably the smallest seed that was sown by the Jewish people. And it was very a very common symbol of that which is tiny. When people talked, when Jews talked about things that were tiny, they would go, oh, like the mustard seed. And so it was it was a very common picture of something that was tiny, mustard seed. And the small beginnings and pervasive growth of God's kingdom were beyond both the patience and the understanding of his disciples. Over and over, Jesus' disciples didn't have the patience to hear what he was saying. He would give them these pictures of the kingdom, and they still went, okay, so when is the kingdom going to come and overthrow the Romans? It was like a one-track, one-track mind. You ever had that problem when you're talking with someone, and you felt like they're, they're not listening to you? They, they can't actually hear your words? That for some reason, they, they, they're thinking about what, what they're thinking about or what they're going to say next, but they have no ability to actually hear what you're saying. Jesus had that problem with his disciples. And it, it's actually a very common problem in marriage, when, especially when, when we get into, get into a fight and, and, and we're just wanting to prove our point to our partner or to our spouse and, and, and we just keep, you know, like, we can't wait for them to stop talking so we can say our thing. And sometimes we even interrupt them to say our thing before they're even done. We can't help ourselves. We can't help ourselves. It's, it's human, but sometimes we need to be able to exercise patience to listen. Someone once told me that God gave us one mouth and two ears. So we should listen twice as much as we speak. Husbands, I may have just saved your week right there. <laughs> so Jesus, in his, in his metaphor about the kingdom, he, he's trying to help them understand the kingdom is small. It begins very small, almost unnoticeable, that nobody would notice it. But it does grow. And its influence grows and its power grows. And don't, he's trying to get this, this idea across to his disciples. Don't be fooled by what you see in the world. There's power in the world, and, and, and there are power players in the world, and there are influential people in the world, but the kingdom does not mimic them. The kingdom does not play by those rules. The kingdom is very different. Think of it as very small, like this mustard seed. And so the the mustard seed illustrated both how tiny the kingdom is, how, how insignificant it seems to the world, but also how when the kingdom begins to grow, it does have influence. It does change things. It does provide blessings. It does provide cover. And and, and so the kingdom, this mustard seed, while it's among the smallest, it grows into this big bush that can be between 3 and 12 feet tall, the mustard seed plants. So the metaphor emphasizes the small beginnings and the gradual and remarkable growth of the kingdom. The rule and the reign of God are important for God's people to understand and for God's people to grab hold of, or else Jesus wouldn't have talked about it. He wouldn't have told all these parables. He, he, we're just looking at four weeks in a row of looking at specific parables where Jesus goes, the kingdom is like this. The kingdom is like this. The kingdom is like this. And he wants his people to understand some things 
about his kingdom. So when the kingdom grows, it does eventually grow farther and faster than anyone ever envisioned, envisioned or expected. So um, let's consider the growth, for example, of the church, the early church. So it began with how many disciples did Jesus have? Twelve disciples. So we've got these twelve disciples. And then other followers began to emerge. And then pretty soon Jesus had 500 followers within his lifetime. All right? Within his lifetime. By the end of Jesus' life, it's estimated that there were 500 committed followers who were with him. That were all in with the kingdom. Were all in with, as followers of Jesus. And, and, and then... Later, um, in, in, and we know about the 500 from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 6, kind of tells us that before Jesus died, he had these 500. Peter brought a message at Pentecost. And how many people came to faith at Pentecost? Remember? 3,000. Very good. You guys know your Bible. Well, very good. In, in, Acts, in, in the book of Acts, it, it kind of tells us that um, the, the numbers steadily rose, Acts 4.4, 4, Acts 5.14, Acts 6, 1 through 7. It tells us we see the growth of the church and, the, and, and, and more and more people. It steadily rose in spite of the weaknesses of the Christian church. The message was carried onto other continents, into other countries. And beyond the scope of Israel, and even outside the Roman Empire. And the message went farther and farther, and, 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 and it, it tells us in Revelation 5.9 that one day, saints from every nation will gather together worshiping Jesus all together. We even see it in our own church, in the few of us, multiple nations from among ourselves right here. We, we, that somehow we came together, we came, we came to faith in Jesus. M maybe we would n never even know each other or connect with each other apart from what we share in common, our faith in Jesus. Well, today, the way of Jesus is a global movement that reaches into every continent on the earth. That's not too shabby for a mustard seed. Would you agree? Well, in Luke 17, 6, it tells us that faith, like a mustard seed, Jesus said, moves what? Moves mountains. Jesus said, if you'll have faith like a mustard seed, again, he's going, little things. Just have a little bit of faith, and you can do great things. You can do mighty things with a little bit of faith. It's very consistent with what Jesus is saying here, just like he says, this mustard seed thing in faith like a mustard seed in Luke 17. The kingdom of God has this effect on our lives that as we embrace it, it starts really small. It starts very small. But then it can grow and permeate our lives. And, and, and sometimes you find yourself, you, you, as you, the longer you follow Jesus, you go, you know what, I'm not interested in what I used to do leaving it behind. I got to change my friends because following Jesus isn't consistent with that and my friends are kind of distracting me away from Christ or tempting me into behavior that doesn't honor God. And then we, we start changing our friends and we start changing our lives. We start changing what we watch and what we read and what we take in and the things we do because the kingdom grows within us and its influence changes us. The second thing I want to point out about this, this parable is there's a warning in verse 32 that Jesus gives us in this, in this parable. And I'll, I'll go ahead and read in verse 32. It says this, yet when it is sown, the mustard seed, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants, and puts out large branch branches so that the birds of the air can make their nests in its shade. Now, a mustard seed is what is used. If you use yellow mustard, that's what they use to make 
yellow mustard. They add water and vinegar and whatever else they add to it and crush it up. And that's what makes our mustard that we like putting on our hamburgers and hot dogs. And, and so th that's why you see these, these yellow flowers that grow on the mustard seed plants when they grow up. And the warning that I want to bring to you has to do with the birds that it talks about in, that come in, into the, the branches and, and they rest. And, and it even said in, in the scripture, it said they, they make nests in the shade of the mustard seed plant or the mustard plant. In the parable of the sower and the four soils, which we talked about three weeks ago, Jesus, and that would have been taken place at the same setting, at the same teaching. When Jesus told the, the, the parable of the four soils, he talked about birds of the air that came and snatched up the good seed. And those birds of the air that came and snatched up the good seed, they represented Satan and his servants coming and snatching up the word of God. The seeds represented the word of God sown in people's lives. And the birds snatched up the seed. It told us in the parable of the four soils. Well, if we would be consistent with that interpretation, which took place at the same setting, then we need to think of this as what Jesus meant when he says these birds showed up in the mustard seed plants. So there's a warning in this parable as, as we're taught in this same setting. But to be fair, I just want to say this, that Bible scholars are divided on what the birds of the air represent. Uh, there are definitely those who picture the birds of the air coming into this mustard seed as meaning that the kingdom is inclusive and it provides blessing to others. And then there are those who say that this is a warning. And I can see value and merit in both interpretations and both provide consistency with Jesus' other teachings. Like when Jesus said that he, we need to, there'll be a time in the future when God will separate the sheep from the goats. The sheep will enter into heaven and the goats will not. And, and it also talks about, Jesus talked about separating the wheat from the chaff or the wheat from the tares. And the wheat is good, kingdom people that will enter into fellowship with God. And, and so we see kind of both here. And this interpretation reminds me of 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 2, where Paul said, I have fed you the milk of the Word of God, but not solid food because you were not ready for it. And when you're ready to receive it, Here's a solemn warning from this parable about the mustard seed. And it's this, that the growth of God's kingdom will result in the conversion of many, but not the whole world. The growth of God's kingdom will result in the salvation of many people, but not everyone in the world will come to faith. In fact, some of the growth of God's kingdom will give Satan the opportunity to get in and do some damage. Some of the growth of God's kingdom provides an opportunity for Satan to come in and do some damage. We even see examples of this in Scripture. Judas, in the band of 12 disciples, provided an opportunity right when there was only 12 of them. Judas was an opportunity for Satan to come in and do some damage. And beyond that, in the book of Acts, Ananias and Sapphira were in fellowship with the Jerusalem church. And in Acts 5, 1 through 11, Ananias and Sapphira were instruments of Satan. Uh, Simon Magus, in Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 24, you can read this story of Simon Magus was part of the church in Samaria. And he was a deceiver and an instrument of Satan. In, the, in, in Paul's writings, there were deceptive ministers 
who invaded the church in Corinth. 2 Corinthians 11, verses 13 through 15. People thought of them as ministers, and they were instruments of Satan. See, when the, when, as the kingdom flourishes, it does provide opportunity for Satan to come in and tempt, and Satan to come in and use people who will deceive. And there are often those who come in, and they're what we call wolves, in sheep's clothing. And the wolves come in to distort the truth, to deceive believers, and to divide the church. When we have a big net, when we have a big net, you have to be ready for the possibility of catching both good and bad fish, like Jesus talked about in Matthew 13, verses 47 through 50. So be on guard. Be on guard. Have your eyes wide open. Abide in Christ. Know the Word. Read the Word daily so that you can understand so the seeds grow into kingdom. The kingdom within you. Trust Him to lead you. Find trusted advisors and a trusted fellowship of God's people who can surround you with good counsel who are authentic men and women of the faith. But the passage ends with this, in verse 33 and 34. It says, With many such parables he spoke. He spoke the word to them, and they were able to hear it, as they were able to hear it, excuse me. With many such parables he spoke the word to them, as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples he explained everything. This reminds me of John 16, 12, where, where Jesus, it says that he has many things to tell when the large crowds were there. He has many things to tell them, but not all of you can receive it, so they won't get it now. Privately, Jesus helps his disciples understand, comprehend, and receive what he's teaching us. And I want to share with you the rest of the story about the painting of the Last Supper. As Leonardo worked on the faces of the other disciples, he often tried to paint the face of Jesus. But he couldn't make any progress. And it was drawing on and it was taking much longer than he expected. And he was commissioned for this painting and it was taking a long time. And he had this block, an artist block, a creative block, where he couldn't paint the face of Jesus. And in time, he, he was frustrated and confused, and in time he realized what was wrong. His hatred for this other painter was holding him back from finishing the face of Jesus. Only after making peace with his fellow painter and repainting the face of Judas after that was he able to paint the face of Jesus and complete the masterpiece. You see, the conspiracy of God's kingdom, the mustard seed works within us and it grows, it changes us. It can be a block to progress if we're not in obedience with God, if we're not aligning our hearts with the Lord's goodness and His grace. And isn't that how God works? Where there's grace, nothing but grace. God doesn't judge us. God doesn't reject us. Anyone who comes to Him, the Lord receives. He doesn't say, get cleaned up before you come to me. He says, come as you are. And that's the way of Jesus. And so that's how the church is meant to be. No one has to pretend. No one has to put on a happy face or look a certain way or be impressive to be received into God's kingdom and to be received into the church. Because we follow Jesus and His ways. The conspiracy of the mustard seed works in many ways. It's the smallest conspiracy, like we said, the very smallest conspiracy, 
But when it takes a root in your heart, it becomes pervasive. It changes you from within. And there's within that heart becomes goodness and abundance and generosity and love and forgiveness. And it takes place within you and it takes place through you. So I want to share with you six quick lessons that we learned from this parable, from this little conspiracy of the mustard seed and how the kingdom takes root within our hearts. You may want to write this down. Here are six lessons we learn from the conspiracy of the mustard seed. The first is that is patience and nurturing. Patience and nurturing is the first lesson we learn from the mustard seed. The parable forces on us the importance and the care of endurance in your spiritual development. Your spiritual development doesn't happen overnight. It happens with, with patience. Day by day, as you do the right things, the right thing being, I trust you, God. The right thing being, I'm going to crack open the Word and let the Word begin to permeate my soul. As you read the Word, as you study the Word, the Word is quick and powerful. The, it tells us, Paul wrote, sharper than any two-edged sword, cutting between joints and marrow. The Word changes us as we receive it, as we, as we employ it into our lives. So, patience is required of kingdom growth within us. Like a seed that needs proper care and attention, it needs water and sunlight and nutrients from the soil. So our spiritual growth frequently demands time and attention. You won't grow without time and attention. The second thing is faith and belief. The second lesson from the mustard seed is faith and belief. The mustard seed is a symbol of faith. Faith like a mustard seed. Little faith. Have little faith. You don't have to have big faith. If you don't have big faith in God, that's okay. It's okay. Just have little faith like a mustard seed and watch what God does in your life and what God, watch what God does through your life. A, a, a faith like a mustard seed can lead to big changes and big developments of the kingdom. It serves as a reminder not to dismiss or undervalue little beginnings, small things, insig insignificant things that are unimportant, that people don't take notice of. <laughs> I kind of think of our church. We're, we're like the hidden church. Like we don't have a, a, we, a, a building that, that like people can see our building and drive by and then just show up. We're the hidden church, but yet God's kingdom is here, Amen. and it flourishes within, and we are his people, and his grace is within us, and he's doing great things in our lives, and he's doing great things through our lives. You're an instrument of God's grace. But the, the third lesson that this parable of the mustard seed teaches us is humility. 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 The most humble beginnings, like the mustard seed, can lead to big things. It serves as a reminder not to dismiss or undervalue things, people, ideas that appear unimportant or insignificant. The, the fourth lesson is inclusivity. Inclusivity. This is the other side of the warning about the birds. The fact that the mustard seed can shelter birds of the air and, and it speaks to the welcoming character of God's kingdom. All who want to receive can come and be part of God's kingdom and experience the blessings of the Lord from people who are of different backgrounds can come and find refuge in God's kingdom. Fifth, God's kingdom and power. The mustard seed teaches us about God's kingdom and power. The story emphasizes how the mustard seed plant, if you want to hit that next slide, the mustard seed plant expanded from a little seed representing the expansion of God's kingdom into all of the world. So don't underestimate God's power 
and, and, and as to answer your prayers. Don't underestimate God's power to overcome your current obstacles. God's kingdom and power, the little mustard seed teaches us, is real and will change things and transform things in our lives. Sixth, the inspiration for acts of kindness. The parable can motivate people to do good deeds and spread hope because even the smallest actions can impact other people's lives. Do you have no idea the smallest thing? Do you know that, that sometimes just you praying for someone can change things for them? Just you praying for someone. I was talking with Henry today. Henry was, was telling us in prayer group this morning about someone came to faith. He posted some video about, about just his faith on his Instagram. And a guy came to faith from watching that and then found Henry and told him about it. Like, you never know the impact of your story in someone's life. You never know the impact of someone's story by your life. The, the parable shows us that small actions can make a big difference. It's like Jesus said in Matthew 25, 40. He said, the king will reply, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. You're serving Jesus by serving people. And, and so as we close out this message, I want to offer two invitations. Two invitations. First, I'm going to offer, I'm going to go to the Lord in prayer. And, and I just want, this first invitation is that some of you may be ready and in need of walking across the line of faith. There's a line in your life that you come to at some point where you go, I'm done living my way. I'm going to trust God. I'm going to lean into God's goodness. And, and, and that might be you today. And I just want to give you the opportunity, if you just want to join me in prayer, just bow your heads and close your eyes, everybody, right now for a brief moment and pray with me. If you're ready to walk across the line of faith, to put your faith in Jesus, to experience the mustard seed conspiracy in your own life. Pray a simple prayer in the quietness of your heart between you and God. Let God know, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready, God. Will you come into my life? I'm ready, God. Will you be the Lord of my life? Jesus, I believe in you, and I want to experience your goodness in my life. Pray in your own words, but welcome the Lord into your heart. Now, the second invitation I want to offer is I want to invite all of you. You can, you can look up. I want to invite all of you to join together in a kingdom conspiracy. I want to invite you guys for us together to enter into a kingdom conspiracy right now. And this kingdom conspiracy, this mustard seed conspiracy that I want to present to you shows us how little things can make a big difference. And this conspiracy begins with a text. Anybody have a phone? Anybody have a phone with you? This conspiracy begins with a text. And it's called 21 Days of Hope. And we're going to begin 21 Days of Hope next Sunday, March 10th. 21 Days of Hope. And I want to invite all of you into this conspiracy. 21 Days of Hope. And it's a digital journey where you'll discover meaningful challenges that either bring hope to you or through you each day. And these 21 days, these 21 days of hope are designed for all of us to make an impact this Easter. The 21 days ends March 30th, the day before Easter. And so I want to invite you to 21 days of hope. These 21 days are designed for, to, to grow your faith, stretch your faith, and have an, for your faith to have an impact. So 
Have you ever been on a missions trip? Anyone ever been on a missions trip in this room? Anyone? Anyone? A few? A few? Some of you guys have? I highly recommend going on a mission trip. If you've never been on a mission trip, you should go. The last mission trip I went on, a group of us from this church, we went to Mexico in Tijuana. And it was an amazing time where we did daily children's outreaches in, in, in communities all in the city and around Tijuana. And we stayed in an orphanage named Colina de Luz, which is a Christian home for children to find hope. It's this amazing place where hope just oozes from the ceilings because of all the hope that's being found there. And for, for more than a generation, this place, orphan children have found hope. And goodness, it's such an amazing place. Well, 21 Days of Hope is like going on a missions trip right here, right here, right now. And it begins with a text. And you don't have to go across the border to get there. The impact that we'll have will be felt right here locally, right there locally for you guys online. And, and I'm so excited for us to do 21 Days of Hope together, and I urge every one of you to join 21 Days of Hope. You, you have to go sign up at the back of the room at the resource table. There's a list. Just put your name and your cell phone. It's got to be a cell phone where you can receive texts. It, it's, not, it's not an email thing. It, it, it's a text thing. So I want to invite you to it, 21 Days of Hope, online and in person. We welcome you to it. For you guys online, send us an email to info at victoryanaheim.org. Let us know you want to be part of it. Make sure your cell phone is included on it. You'll receive a text each day with a challenge that either brings hope to you or through you. And you'll, you'll only receive the text if you sign up for the kingdom conspiracy with us. So be sure that before you walk out that door, that you go, I see some people signing up right now. I, before you walk out this door, make sure you sign up for 21 Days of Hope. The kingdom conspiracy begins today. In Jesus' name. Will you rise with us as we sing?
Thanks, worship team. Great job. Hey, if you put your faith in Jesus, will you make sure and make sure and let us know? Because we want to get behind you in your faith. Whether you're online or someone in person, if you're in person, make sure you fill out at a connect card at the resource table. Put your name and information on there. Let us know. Stick it in the little black box at the back of the room. There, there are connect cards right there at that little table. And online, send us an email to info at victoryanaheim.org. We, we want to um, take our, our offering, and as we take our offering, there's, there's just two simple ways that you can do it. You can use our secure website at victoryanaheim.org slash donate, or use this QR code. It'll take you right there. Just hold your phone up to the screen right now. It'll take you right there. And it's a secure platform where you can set up your recurring giving there. God bless you as you give. And you can also use the giving box in the back of the room at the resource table. And I want to also give you an announcement that Easter is coming up, and we have this huge event that we're putting on the week before Easter. It's going to be at the park right behind us, Maxwell Park. And we're, we're doing this in partnership with several other churches locally that we want to put on a huge thing for families to bring their kids to. And, and, and have there's going to be games, face painting, all kinds of things. City services will be there. The, the police will be there with, with where, they, where they have, you can see their, 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 their cars and the fire truck will be there. And the, even the Easter Bunny's going to be there. Even the Easter Bunny's going to be there. By the way, I forgot to tell you guys, our young adults, pray for them. They're all in the rain. They went camping for the weekend. All of our young adults are, are there. They, they, they all went, the diehards, and they, they camped all weekend. I think they come back sometime today, and um, but they they I, I heard they they were having I saw some pictures they were sending pictures they were having a great time but we miss them and we'll look forward to receiving them back. And I also want to say that um, as Easter is coming up and this big outreach event that we're doing, we just want to bless our city with the love of Jesus by banding together with other churches. Like we're not in competition with other churches. <laughs> We're part of the same team in Christ's name. And, and so we're banding together with several churches. We're modeling Christ-like unity by putting this event on with several other churches, even Magnolia Baptist right down the street, a half a block away from us. We're, we're, we're doing this together. And, and um, Sandals Church, about a mile from here, and there, there's, but there's several churches, about six churches. Even one Catholic church is doing it with us. And as we do this, we want to model love and just bring love and bless our community. Last year, we had uh, over 2,000 people show up for this event. And, and, and this year, we expect it to be even more. And um, we need volunteers. We're starting to recruit volunteers to come help with setup that morning and tear down that afternoon. It, it starts at, um, the event starts, it goes from 10 to 1230 on the, the Saturday before, a, a week and a day before Easter. And, and I also want to let you know that the, we're going to have 20,000 Easter eggs for the Easter egg hunt. 20,000. And our churches, personally, we're bringing 5,000. Now, the, the, there's just little eggs that have a piece of candy in each one. And so far, we've collected 2,500 pieces of candy. So we're halfway there to what we need. And we're inviting you to bring candy next Sunday and, and, and the Sunday after that. Uh, we're filling, our small groups are filling up these, these, uh, these eggs and we could use your help. So we invite you to come be part of it. 
and anticipate just being a blessing to the community. Everyone, I don't care if this is your first time here or you, you, you come every week, we, can, we, we will welcome your help as volunteers on that day. And, um, and so there'll be a sign-up sheet. We'll, we'll put a sheet in the back that you can just put, hey, I'm ready to help for Easter. We need, we need people at our booth. We need people to help set up, tear down, to help with games, to help um, hide Easter eggs, all that stuff. So God bless you guys. Rise up once more as the worship team leads us out, and God bless you guys. Your name.